Go. Go. Okay, I'm on. Welcome. Welcome. Those who will be online and those who will watch later. Today's message is a simple, quiet, non-confrontive message that um, I thought would be very gentle for you guys today in case we had new people here. And now I repent for lying before the congregation. We'll be in the book of Acts. Today's message is called The Plan of God. So we'll probably start in Genesis. We'll probably finish by 6 o'clock tonight. Okay, and we'll have food ordered in. All right? The plan of God will be in Acts 15, starting in verse 6 today. That's interesting, the picture you put up. A compass. You draw architecturally, right, with a compass. Wait till you hear the message. Chapter 15, verse 6. Now the apostles and others came together to consider this matter. What matter? Last week's message, if you didn't remember, they were talking about circumcision and what they were going to do with the Pharisees who wanted men to be circumcised if they were Gentiles and got saved. And when they'd been, been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles shall hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God who knows the heart and acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And make no distinction between us and them. Purifying their hearts are by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barabbas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And they laid, and they had them become silent, and James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take, them, take of them a people for his name. And this is the words of the prophet, agreeing just as it is written. This is how Amos, okay? After this, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David. Rebuild something architecturally. Which had fallen down, I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. So the rest of mankind may speak, seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Known to God from eternity all his words. Therefore, I will judge that we should not trouble those among the Gentiles who are turning to God. But we write to them to abstain from these polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has, throughout many generations, those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Guess what? The church is having division. Does it happen today? Yes. They're fighting over the law or grace. So what happened is they called together the apostles and the elders of the church in Jerusalem. And James, who is the brother of Christ, is leading the meeting. And now they're going to decide what they think needs to be done. As I'm, I kind of avoided this. I've been reading some other things this week. And uh, I told Brown, I'm reading the book. It's only 470 pages, so. Um, and Brown went, oh, it's too thick. Well, and super thin pages, too. Small print. We are in a season of rebuilding the tabernacle of David. We fight amongst ourselves sometimes between charismatic, Baptist, whatever you want to call it. We go to our corners and we fight on who's right and who's wrong. 
So there's a fight right now in the scripture, the first time. that God's been moving. There's been persecution. There's been attacks. God's moving, doing miracles. And now we got this thing we need to find out. Do those coming to Christ need to live by the law of Moses or by grace? And it's been a fight in the church from the beginning. Isn't it amazing that when we sing this song that some people get kind of excited about today, about we're free and, and God bought us and saved us and did all these things and people stomp their feet and get all excited about it. I'm not saying who it is. That we get excited that when someone gets saved. Because they come forward, they confess that they need a Savior, they realize they're a sinner, they get saved, and we get all excited. And then we say, oh, by the way, now we've got these rules we want you to do so we know you're saved. Now think about that. Okay, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? As I shared last week, what are we going to do when we meet the guy that was on the cross with Christ who made Hep paradise that day? Well, you know, I joked about last week, you know, here he, he, he makes heaven. And the guy who's guarding heavenly gate, what are you doing here? Hey, he told me I could come. Well, did you, did you do the Bible studies you were supposed to do? Bible studies? Is there Bible study? And we, and we put everyone through a, a loop that they have to do, but yet we want them to be saved. And when they get saved, we tell them everything they've got to do, and then they can't follow through and therefore they walk away because we put so much in the church upon people's behavior after they're saved and don't see how much grace can take them to their behavior that God wants them to be in did you know that you can do more by grace than you can by works you have your man in this passage, the Apostle Paul, who was a Pharisee, who was desiring to kill Christians and to stop the Christ movement because it wasn't by the law. And then he meets Christ on the road, on the way to Damascus, he gets saved, and then it says, what do you do? He went away for three years into the desert, into the Mount of God, and many believe he went to the mountain where Moses was, where God came down. Many think he went there and hung out for three years. And what was he doing? He was meeting the word of God that he had put into him, and God was releasing grace that he would understand the fullness of it. God doesn't wipe away his word, but he wants us to understand it through the work of the cross and by grace. Grace is not free. Christ paid for it. So when we think we receive grace, no, Christ paid for our sins. Okay? And he did it because he loves us. And so here's this confrontation. They're coming together. How are we going to settle this dispute between works and grace? And the Gentiles, as we, I've talked before, if we pass it through this, they weren't welcome in Judaism at all. They were dogs. That's why at one point Peter and Paul get into it when Peter wanted to uh, not eat with Gentiles when the Jews came into town. You know? But yet when Jesus was here, he sat down with sinners and, every, and all the Pharisees got upset. You know who you're eating with? Yeah, I do. Well, if you're a God, why are you eating with them? I came for the sick, not the well. When James and John wanted to call fire down on those over there on that weren't doing things right, Jesus said, what? what spirit are you of, boys? Why did I come? I didn't come to kill. I came to redeem. I came to save. And so there's this moment in the church, and I think we're coming right back to it again. And everything God's been putting in my heart for weeks is there's got to be a return to the gospel. A return where people don't come here because they got to live up to something rather than live in something. When I got saved, I lived in something. When you get saved, it is Christ within you. Okay? He doesn't say, okay, uh, you didn't check the box today. I'm going to move out. 
No, he says, what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Well, hold it here. Did I do it right today? You might not have, but that's what it says in 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. When you begin to walk in this grace that they're talking about here, you don't want to sin because it's free. You're free. The chains are removed from the bondages that have been put over you in your sin. That's what he writes in Romans. So when you start going through this passage, Peter's the first one that stands up, and what he's doing, he's reminding them of Cornelius, chapter 10 of Acts. Cornelius, the Gentile, sends forth, he has a vision, and an angel come and send Peter, he'll tell you what you need to know. Peter's on a roof, he goes into a trance, these men are going to show up, go with them. What was God doing? God was coming and confronting the religious order, saying, I'm in charge. I want Cornelius saved. I mean, if we would just stay in John 3.16 for a month, we might see salvation. Because God so loved the world. They don't believe God loved the world. I heard a story today from someone this morning, and and how they've had tragedy in their lives. And everybody wants to blame God for the tragedies. It's sin. Tragedies are done to people by sin. They sin. And so Christ died on the cross. Why? To stop sin. But who gets blamed when something bad happens, God? Well, if he's almighty, why did he stop that person from doing that? Well, if he stopped all sin, all of us would be in trouble. Think about it. If he stepped into your life before you knew him and stopped your sin and judged you, you'd be in hell. We don't look at it that way. We look at the fact that once we're saved, we're okay, but what about them people? Well, them people are us. Except we're washed by the blood of the Lamb. So we got this... Convict, and what are we going to do? So what happens is, there's a testimony that Peter gives. Remember, guys, I was sent to Cornelius. Remember what happened. He received the baptism of the Spirit. He received the Spirit of God, and therefore, how can we say it's not God? I'm glad that I had personal encounters with God in the beginning of my walk, that kept me going away from works. Why? Because in my life growing up, I always worked hard to be loved. I had to work hard to prove to my dad that I was good. I had to achieve in athletics to prove I was good. I would do everything I could in works to prove I was okay. And then I'd get saved. And then, right away, the enemy comes and says, what? Are you doing it right? No, I'm not, oh God. And that voice goes off in our heads. You didn't quite do enough this week, did you? And that inner core of me that says I have to work to be loved rises up. So what if today we release whatever work is deep in us that tells us in a culture of works? As I shared last week, you're going to have a job evaluation, Dan. And you're going to evaluate at work whether you did good or bad. Okay? We're all getting evaluated all the time. Our children are being evaluated in school all the time. A, B, C, or D, or F. We have a whole culture that you don't get a raise unless you bust butt, right? Whoops, that'll be cut out. But that's true. We always have to perform. And then Christ comes along and says, I love you. What do I got to do? Love me. What does he say to do? If you love me, obey my command. He doesn't give a long dissertation of all the things you have to do. 
Then that word commands. Oh God, what if I miss one? Never mind you. When you get saved, it's easy to sit down in the morning when you start in the morning and do this. Uh, good morning, Lord. Love you. Uh, forgive me of my sins. And Lord, could you remind me of anything I really need to remember? When I started praying that way, when I first got saved, and I was working in the middle, and I was going in at 5 in the morning, at 4 o'clock I start, and I prayed. He, and then somehow this voice in my head would remind me what I did. Why? Because I asked. Lord, I want to be right. What, uh, uh, reveal to me by the Holy Spirit something that... Not that I would be judged, that I would be free. He paid for it. When we do ministry here, me and Paul, the biggest thing we have to work with with people for them to be free is that they realize it's paid for whatever they've been through or whatever they've done. We don't let people off the hook. You know, it's been, I, I'm, I should be exhausted. Maybe I'm tired. My wife told me I was tired on Friday because of, of what I was doing on Thursday. But I traveled to the Middle East this week. It was good. I went to Palestine in Israel, in Jordan. Can you imagine? Right here, in Red Bluff. Let me tell you how much God is moving. Let me give you an example. This is crazy. So, this guy, of course, we don't know when people contact my wife to get a ministry appointment. If he escapes, there's people who will catch him. Okay, don't worry about it. Just enjoy. He has a nice home in Fairfield, and he has one of those cameras that films, and, and you pick up voice, people talking. Well, he had an issue in his life, a very strong issue that he wanted healing in. And he has a pastor, he has a church, and he's doing all of that. Well, he has a guy that's coming over to work on his house is on the phone. And he's coming to the door, and, he's, and he, he sees him on the video, and the guy goes, yeah, yeah, you know, I know these people in Red Bluff. He said, they really helped me with my marriage, and um, uh, they're really neat guys, but, you know, and he's just talking away. And so... He lets the guy in, and he goes, who are those guys? He goes, what guys? He goes, guys, oh, my, it wasn't, he hadn't been here. His friend had been here. Now, the friend had been here. He's talking about it to his friend on the phone. Now this guy wants help. And so he, said, he goes, I'm going to go there. So he rode from Fairfield on Thursday to come up and get freedom. You hear, you hear grace? You see grace? The man needed help. And then when he came, oh my God, okay, where are you, where are you from? I'm from Fairfield. I, I work in San Francisco. And he never, now listen, he never tells anybody of his origin. He was born here. And he goes, I don't know why I told you guys, but I'm Palestinian. He goes, why am I telling? I don't tell people that because, you know, and you know his word was, the whole world's against us. It was great ministry. It was grace, people. It wasn't a work. It was someone testifying of what God does, and someone heard it, and in their need, they grabbed it. And, and, and the scary thing, now he wants me and Paul and our wives to drive to Fairfield for lunch. So his wife can make us an Arabic dinner. You want to go? You want to go? He goes, I'll tell you. Uh, it, he goes, we're going to have some lamb. And we're going to have... Uh, <laughs> and, and so he contacts my wife. When can we set it up? But what I'm trying to teach you very clearly here is if we live by the law, this never happens. Immediately sends a message. Tell them thank you. Why are you guys spending so much time with me? Because God did it with us. 
when you begin to see what Paul and Peter are talking about here, you're going to see something must come back to the church of Jesus Christ. Something has to come back that we get out of our legalistic fights between charismatic, Pentecostal, Baptist, sensationist, and all of that. It all going to work out. When we all get there, we're going to find out none of us had it all right. None of us. But there's one thing we can get right. Jesus Christ and the gospel. So in this passage... They mentioned the gospel. That's what they're there for. That means it's a promise of salvation, it's fulfillment by life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. I'm going to say it again. His life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. That is the gospel. So my brothers who don't believe in prophetic words of this day, it can't offend me if I prophesy. Because if they believe in the gospel, then God will work it out between me and them. I don't need to war with it. I need to walk in what God called me to do and let them love God their way. But when we start loving God the way we're supposed to love God, we ain't going to see division. Our missionary Nikolai, when he was preaching behind the Iron Curtain, living in Ukraine, and all this stuff was going on, his pastor went to prison 22 years for having a Bible. And then when the curtain fell, they took an a, a evangelist into Kentucky, and there were three Christians on this whole peninsula. They did a crusade. They had a revival meeting. Guys got saved. They started the church there. There's 22 churches there now in your support of your tithe and your giving. And this is what Nikolai said. When the wall came down, we all were working together for three years, Baptist and Pentecostal, charismatic. And then we went to our corners and started fighting our fight again. So we said, guess what? I guess we need persecution again. And guess what they got? Persecution again. Because he said, we didn't care if you believed in tongues or not in tongues. We just want to know, do you believe in the gospel? What if this coming year is a movement of the gospel again? That we spend more time going, do you know about the life of Christ? Do you know he died for you? And when he died for you, God raised him from the dead. And when he raised him from the dead, he, he put him ascension and he's on the throne. It's good news, he paid for you. Well, I don't want it. Okay, you don't have to have it, but that's, that's for you. So they're fighting all this to stop religion. Peter, who would not eat with Gentiles for a while, got rebuked by Paul. Paul, wouldn't, he was out killing Christians. He gets saved by grace. And all this is good. And we can go back and you can read all the verses up to chapter 15 and all the miracles were being done and everything, okay? But this is just the warm-up of the message. God wants to restore something. He wants to rebuild his tabernacle, David. Isn't it amazing? They're trying to figure out what to do with the Gentiles, and it was all written down in the Word of God. It was all there. The Pharisees knew that word of Amos that was being written right here in verse 17, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. What? Who? All the what? Gentiles. It was already written. That's why I'm encouraging you. If you're not signed up yet, I don't know why, but I just think Pastor Paul has something he's about to release in our community through the Word of God, starting in Genesis, is going to shake the foundations of hell in this city. Who are we here? Who are we? What's our identity? 
What do we do here? I know we'd have another 40, 50 people here if we wouldn't worship so long. I know we would. Because I've been told over and over, you know, I really like to preach in the presence of God there, but do you have to do so many songs? I mean, you know, I mean, can't be done by noon? You're laughing, but it's true. Of all the passages in Scripture that James pulls out, he pulls out Amos. Of all of Isaiah, all of Jeremiah, all of Ezekiel, all the prophetic words about the coming of the kingdom, he pulls out this one. Of course, he didn't pull it out. It was the voice of God speaking again. I will have the tabernacle of David again. So why don't we talk about Tabernacle of David? David broke all the rules. Did you know that? He broke the rules. He broke the rules, people. You know how he broke it? When the ark came into the city of Jerusalem, he didn't hide it and let religious people only do it. He opened up a tent. And open air worship in Jerusalem and hired, I don't know how much they estimated money why he paid for musicians and worshipers 24 hours a day in worshiping God who sat on the ark. Get it? God was with the ark. The presence of God was on the ark. The mercy seat was on the ark. And David didn't hide it. He opened it up. He broke the rules of the Levites and said, no, we're just going to have an open-air worship time of God. And you know what happened? God came and inhabited Jerusalem. Woo! I can, oh, the Holy Ghost is moving. He, he, he inhabited. He broke the rules. What the heck? What is wrong with that man? And you know how he got in trouble? As he's bringing the ark in, he's dancing in his underwear, worshiping God. And his wife, Micah, said, oh, you're king. How dare you dance before the women like this? I wasn't dancing before the women. I'm dancing for my king. And you know what it said? And Micah never called him children because she didn't understand David's heart for God. So we're, we're going to look at something here. So why don't you put up 2 Samuel 6, 17, please. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set in a place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. It's not a building. It's a tent. Then David offered burnt offerings and beef offerings before the Lord. He established the presence of God. You go back and read in Samuel when, when, they had, when uh, the Philistines had the uh, ark. It didn't work out too good. No. Their god, Dagon, fell over and lost his head. And the Philistines go, we got to get rid of this guy because they broke out in tumors and it wasn't good. So they gave the ark away. We can't have what? Right? We can't have the presence of God in our camp. Because we're what? Evil worshipers. We have other gods. See, God's presence comes and undoes the other gods. You want a move in Red Bluff? Do you want the addiction broken? Do you want freedom for your families? Do you want children no longer being molested? Do you want something to happen? You're going to have to invite God to the city and his presence. It's his presence, people. The enemy cannot take God's presence. So what does he do? Well, we're just going to do our 45 minutes and we're going to get it done and go back and we're going to go watch our football. And then we complain. Where's God? Why won't he come? Why won't he break this thing over our city? Why can they point devil worship on their buildings here? Why, why is there shootings and killings every week? Because God hasn't come. 
He wants to. He pro prophesied to his church. I want to rebuild the house, tabernacle of David. I want my places of worship for the presence of God. That's all he wants. Put up First Chronicles, please. Chapter 16. So they brought the ark to God, set in the midst of the tabernacle, and David erected it. Then they offered burnt offerings, peace offerings, before God. And when they had finished the offering of the burnt offerings, the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he distributed everyone of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread. What? Rainbow couldn't do that. Rainbow bread couldn't do that. Everybody in Israel got bread of life. I am the what? I am the bread. A little bit of play there. A piece of meat. Mm. A cake of raisins. And he put in some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, commanding to thank and praise God of Israel. As Beth the chief, and next to him, and Zechariah, and Israel, and, and James, and I'm not going to pronounce all those names because I can't do it. With string instrument harps, but made music with cymbals. The priests regularly blew the trumpets before the ark of God. That was the tabernacle of David. 24 hours a day, the place was rocking. 24 hours a day, they were blowing horns, worshiping. And God said, I'll come. I'll come to my people. I'll rest right here. I, 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 I'm, I'm invited in. You know why God don't come to cities? He's got to be invited. He's not, he's not an overrider of people. He's a God of choice. First sermon I, I preached. No, that wasn't the first, probably the third. First time in a Pentecostal church. In Joshua, he said, but for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. I want breakthrough. I want us to regain our identity in this house. The one battlefield is the strongest in this house has always been what? Worship. If anybody chooses that place of worship, they get hit, taken out, and quit. It's 1994. Why is that? They all loved the Lord when they grabbed it, but they couldn't take the battle. Because the enemy says, if this house is called by my name and I want to bring my presence, it has to be a house of David. And so worship. We were a little short today. I was ready for 1115. I remember the first time the fairy fragrance of heaven came in this house in 2007. December 23rd. I got a good memory. We didn't preach that day. We began worshiping in the presence of God and the fragrance of heaven filled this whole house. I'll never forget Aaron Peterson on the drums laying his head down, couldn't play the drums, just totally out in the spirit of God. He gave us a clue. I want this house built after the house of David. I want this place to break the yoke of darkness in this culture, in this city. It's about me coming. And how do I come? I come and have the praises of my people. So I'm passing, I'm going, what do I do? He goes, I, I, I think it's time to call the church back to its worship of me. Just a little highlight. They had come to Jerusalem. Was Jerusalem free at the time? Or was it under Roman control? Roman. As you read Renac, do you see anything in here where they're really worried about the government over them? You might see where I'm going with this. They have one mission in mind. Salvation. 
They have one mission in mind, the kingdom of God. They have one mission in mind, save as many as you can. Because they understood that hell was a bad place and heaven's a good place. And yeah, they sit under the most wicked government, one of the most wicked, perverted governments ever walked the face of earth, Rome. Every Caesar was wicked. Wicked. But you don't find them having a council meeting about what we're going to do about the government. Because they're under another government. They're under the government of the Most High God. And in the Most High God, he does what he wants to do because he is king. And all governments are going to fall before him when he comes back. They weren't consumed with, oh my God, did you see what Caesar did? He's got 18 wives and has orgies. What are we going to do? They knew who he was. They knew how wicked he was. They knew he was killing Christians. They knew there was persecution. But they had one vision. The king and his kingdom. And so they're selling the dispute so not that they can not divide, but they might bring the gospel to everyone. And so if we want to rebuild something, we have to understand the purpose of it. Put up Psalm 132, please. <clears throat> Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. Now remember who David is. And what did God say? David, I remember all you went through. Every one of you here, listen. God knows everything you go through. He knows every bit of disease, attack, pain, hurt, brokenness, loss, everything. He knows it. How he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not sleep till my eyes or slumber in my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Can you imagine that prayer? He's telling, and if you go and study it, I'm living in a nice cedar house and God don't have a house. Even though I have a tent, he goes, God deserves the best. And it opened up God's heart to David in all his failings and all this stuff. But he had a heart after God that he would be worshipped and glorified. And he said, hey, David, I, I remember your afflictions. And so guess what? You asked that I would have a house. No one else ever asked for that. There was a moment that the house of God was that important to David that God would have a place to come and rest. Come and have it. That would be glorious to him. And there's mighty structures built all over the world right now. Beautiful structures of architects. They're empty of God. They built them to glorify God, but they've walked away from God. So why will he come here? Because you are the temple of the living God, and if you have your heart's desire that he be glorified, he'll come and meet you. Last week, during the scripture, remember, in the passage in Galatians, we are what? Sons of Abraham. And if we're sons of Abraham, man, we go right to David. Put up verse 8, please. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints, saints shout for joy. God's looking for a resting place. First, it's here. You know what brings the power of God? All of us together, here. When we're in unity, looking at Christ for who he is and what we want, and then we lift holy hands and we call out to God 
then all that's in us, Christ within us, the Spirit comes, and now we have communion with God. Great healings come not by someone laying hands on them, just by the house of God being in the presence of God. Verses 13, please. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have a desire of it. I have abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I also clothe her with priests and salvation, and her saints shall come out aloud for joy. There I will make a horn of David grow. That's power. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. In Hebrew, my Messiah. His enemies I will clothe with shame and put himself, put upon himself a crown and he shall flourish. I went back this morning and I remember when this fellowship started and none of you were here. And I had gone through a terrible battle in another fellowship. I had, by circumstances, uncovered sin at the top of that church and financial regressions that were not good. And the people found out that I was asking questions that would lead as a pastor to uncover what was going on in secret. And I was just a young, on fire. I had this ideal attic of the church and everything good. Mike remembers me in those days. I was so, I called myself stupid later, but I had this belief that I read this and this is what people do. Because I wasn't raised in the church, I never saw the church and it's failing, I didn't see any of that. So when I read something, like, oh, that's good, God, that's a God, and this is who all Christians are. And I was a baby, and the reason I was raised up as an associate pastor at the time, one was my heart for God, but the other is the pastor used me in my prophetic anointing to draw in people left and right. And we were running 200 at the time. So people were coming in because he would pull me up on stage afterwards and I would just prophesy over people in the audience. And they were just coming like groves. Oh, we got to see. God speaks in this house. Pastor didn't have that gift. And then I got realized I was being uh, used like a uh, tool. Actually, God was. No, God kept giving me stuff because he's faithful. Because he wanted the people touched. It wasn't about me. It was about the people and God being glory. And that day, I, finally, I think I finally repented enough and the layers in my heart that this woman was sitting in the front row and she had this red dress on. And of course, it was that time the sermon came. All right, come up, Pastor. Just, do you see anything in the house here you might want to prophesy to? So I prophesied to the woman. And I said, something has happened to your mind. God wants to heal you. That red all over you. I hope, I pray the blood of Jesus will come over you. Whatever your affliction is, may God come and touch you. And I gave her some more details. I remember that day. And she's crying, her friend is crying, and then afterwards, she had a stroke and she was paralyzed on one side. And they snuck her in the building so I wouldn't see her, to see if God could do it. And I realized right then I was just a tool and not 
being honored. God was not really being honored. And I made a stupid comment, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to prophesy anymore. Because I didn't want God put to shame. And everything went south after that, of course. But see, I started hearing things. And when I uncovered the sin, they wiretapped my phone of my office, which is a federal offense, to find out what I knew about the money that they, what they were planning to do, a pastor and a board member. I was this idealistic man that just wanted God to save people and heal people. And then they set me down in what only another pastor might know. It was a, I was on a suicide mission at that moment. They had a meeting and they told me I was unfaithful to leadership and that I wanted to remove the pastor and that I was all wrong in what I was doing. They never gave anything specific. They just said, if you don't trust this church, vote with your feet. And in the church business, that means leave. I said, I'm out. I'm gone. I had a home group that time. I kept getting in trouble because it kept growing because pastor would send all the broken people to my home group. And we were running 35 people in a home group. So I resigned. And that was a supposedly nail in the coffin for me. I was done. I forgot to ask God. My heart was done. Because that was the third time that had happened in my short Christian life. So when some of you say, oh, the church hurt me, or this pastor did this, and I'm not going back to church, then you don't really know Jesus Christ. I'm going to be blunt with you, because I never quit going to church. No matter what came against me, I never stopped, because I wasn't going to church for the denomination, for the oculates. I was going because of Jesus. See, I didn't know in me was the tabernacle of David that God wanted me to prophesy to. Because I'm a worshiper. When I lay on the floor, it isn't to go to sleep. It's to lay my heart before God and hear his voice and worship him. And then people wouldn't leave me alone. So ten people came to my house. We want you to do a Bible study. No. Leave me alone. They said, no, back to me. Finally, I go, fine, we'll do a Bible study. But that's it. Because this is what I said. I will not bring division. I'm not going to take that church and divide it. I'm, you got to listen. That was the spirit in me. That wasn't me. That's the heart of God who's tired of division in his church. Because the gospel has nothing to do about division, it's about restoration. So we did Bible study. And then 10 people came. Then 15 people came. Then 20 people came. And they said, oh, we got to do a church service. I don't want to do church. I don't want to look like I'm up against the other church. I don't want to look like we're going to cause division. They go, but we got people who are hungry for Sunday. So I go, okay, I'll make a deal with you. We'll only do Sunday nights. I wasn't really listening to God. I was listening to the pain of my heart. So we did Sunday night, three of them. And they go, what well, we want a Sunday morning. No, I don't want a Sunday morning. So January 1, 1994, where he had a Sunday morning. And Zion Christian Ministry was birthed. 
And what was amazing is, in my lack of theological understanding, because I hadn't met Dr. Wright yet, I didn't have a full understanding of Zion. But I remember one day I'm saying, well, what are we going to name it? And God says, Zion. I go, what? I knew the New Testament, but not the Old. He said, Zion's going to be the name. And it will be a Christian church, and it will minister. And that's what we've done. All these flags, all these nations. We've got to get one from, we've got to put a Belgium. I mean, the people are coming, they're mad. Where's my Belgium flag? What, you know? And I'm telling you this because what if, in the midst of all this battle that's gone on for 30 years, is now God says, guess what? Now's the time to build the tabernacle. Now's the time to restore it. Now's the time to stand in faith of what I promised. Now's the time that I might open up my spirit over you. Now maybe now's the time for a word and deed revival. Maybe this is the time. Because we're not going to fight in the natural world any longer. We're not going to follow what many churches are doing right now in the world, believe we need to save America when we need to save souls. I am pro-life. You can put that on the internet. But there's nothing that by law is going to change a person's heart but the blood of Jesus Christ. Abortions will stop when a woman and a man get saved and they quit fornicating. That's the book. That's how you can be pro-life. I didn't quit doing drugs until I got saved. There were plenty of laws in the 70s against drugs. You guys got good now. The law never stopped me from sinning. But Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ said there's a better way. Jesus Christ said, rebuild the tabernacle, church. Rebuild the tabernacle. Make it about me. Make, a, make my house about the presence of God. Make it about everything about me, and I will come. And when I come, I'm going to restore the land. I'm going to save Jew and Gentile alike. I'm going to reveal myself to the world, and I will come back another time. That's what this message is about. It's the plan of God that was orchestrated by the prophets of old that the church of Jesus Christ would be a habitation of God. And we've made a habitation for money changers, false prophets, and people with worldly agendas. And it's coming to an end. They'll keep doing their thing, but there'll be a day where God will come and visit the church of Jesus Christ who says, it's about your presence, it's about your tabernacle, it's about who you are, it's not about what you're doing in the world, we're going to save souls. It's going to be a nasty fight, church. A nasty fight. The book I've been reading has been talking about men of God who stood in what I just said. A man said, I'm not going to enter that realm of political science anymore in my church. I'm not going to talk about the news. I'm going to talk about Jesus. He had a church of 4,000. It's now 200. 200! And all he said was, we're going to go what Jesus said. You know what he said? This is the best it's been because I got 200 people who want Jesus. I got 200 people who are laying their life down for the kingdom. I got 200 people who don't care what's going on out there as much as they care what's going on up there. So, I'm drawing the line. I'm drawing the line today. I'm calling for the power of God today. I'm calling for the manifestation of Jesus. I'm calling for the miracles of heaven. I'm calling for the tabernacle of worship and praise to be reestablished in this fellowship. 
I'm calling out God to come and verify this word in us. That Zion Christian ministry has been called to rebuild the tabernacle of David to show forth the churches in town with love and grace that all can be accepted. You can stand on that line, but if you want me, you're going to stand on this line. Don't matter no more. I'm old enough for it, don't care. I don't care. I'm tired. I am tired of seeing the name of Jesus drug in the mud. Not by non-believers, but by believers. Because they're trying to build their kingdom here. And David said, no, I'm going to bring the ark and the presence of God in Jerusalem, and he's going to be worshipped night and day. Presence of God. He took me from one addiction to another. He took me from one addiction to another. I'm addicted to the presence of God. Sorry. If you want it, I'll help you. If you don't want it, oh well. You're missing the best thing in the world. It's the holy presence of the kingdom of God. You can come. Come as a child, it says, and a child shall lead them. Don't you know, in some places by that time, they'd ask the mother to grab the baby. It's a distraction, and, and we don't want to dishonor God. I remember a passage of scripture when the kids wanted to come to Jesus and the religious people said, no, 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 no. And he said, oh, put the child on his lap. He said, come to me like a child and you'll receive the kingdom of God. Get rid of your pride, church, and get humble before God. It is time that the tabernacle of David be rebuilt. Is it tradition or Holy Spirit? See, if you knew my journey as well as maybe Pastor Mike does, the times we've spent together over, I can't count the years now. We can't remember all of them. I've never felt so much joy in my heart right now. I know what I know, I know I don't know everything. But I know God has a plan for you guys here. I know he's about to do something. Pastor's been praying a simple prayer this last two weeks. Strike a match, God, set the grass on fire. Strike the match, God, start a, a grass fire. You ever seen a grass fire burn? It grows fast. So we're starting, you know, and we've done many Bible studies with Pastor Paul. And are you ready for this? We've never had people sign up like this time. I don't know why. If everybody comes to begin with, not to maybe, 33 people, they're coming from Reading. And there's more might come from Reading. They're coming out of Corning. And we can't forget Orland. I'm challenging you. Get yourself ready. There's something about to explode. I believe God will honor his word. That those who make it about his presence, they shall see the glory. When you get to minister the blessing that I've been able to do over 25 years with Pastor Paul. We have people praying for us for revival. We have, we've, we, we got to watch the spiritual daughters that we collect because they get pregnant and then they want to get married. And so what we do, we had, huh? 
No, they get, they get married first. And so this, this lady we've ministered to, and she's in South Carolina, and she got a prophetic word for me. Okay? Because she said, I'm praying for you. I don't know why, but I'm praying for something. This is what you guys get. Listen, because you give to this ministry, you support what I do, this is somebody who got blessed by what you do. Not me, what you give. You two are a gift. I just pray an increase in capacity, strength and rest, and restores both of your souls. I'm so grateful for the way you have and continue to bless my life, but I continue to pray that God creatively, abundantly fills you and Pastor John to overflowing. Thank you too for yes. This legacy you've built, our building goes forth further back and forward than you may ever know. As I wrote, I got a picture of this triple braided gold cord coming from both of you and Pastor's gut shooting forward to eternity and backward into what has been from the beginning. I pray and release provision and strength over you two right now that these times of ministry will begin to fuel you in ways you have not known. I honor your yes, and I pray this encourages you wherever my words may resonate. That's not for me. It's for you. Because whatever blessing I give out, you have supported it to do it. Okay? Seriously. If you didn't give to support what I do, and you're not so selfish that, Pastor, don't minister to them, just give to us. You understand? Pastors aren't allowed to do that. If, if you minister too much out here, you're not taking care of us. But you've allowed me to do this. You've allowed me to release this gifting that broken people are healed. And now the Lord says, it's your time to reap. It's your time for victory. It's for your time for restoration. It's your time to see the fullness of what you've allowed someone to do and not say, just take care of me. The Lord is going to honor you. He's going to fill you. He's going to break yokes off of you. He's going to restore your families. He's going to break the yoke of darkness over many generations. Because he says, this now is your time, Zion. If you make this house a house of David, so shall I not come, and shall not my presence be here. Shall I not be what I said I would be for you? And how will I not fulfill what I have spoken to you, that this place shall carry an anointing and a blessing that will travel as far as the east is from the west, because this house shall walk in grace, it shall walk in freedom, it shall walk in power, it shall set the captives free, it shall be the gospel. You shall see Isaiah 61, fresh and new, written upon your hearts today. There's going to be an anointing that's going to be released in you that you cannot contain, and you won't want to contain because you're going to have love for those that nobody loves. In Jesus' name. Wow. Amen. Amen. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Whew. And in my homeland, you'd say, that'll wake you up in the morning, by golly. I'm ready to pray, Michelle. <laughs> 